So, will you do it? Robbie asks, twirling a pen in one hand while snapping gum in his mouth. Are you my guy, Chuck? Are you there for me? His smile sparkles, making me squint. Can I count on you? I wonder briefly how much his teeth whitening regimen costs. He has his feet propped on the desk. I can see the logo in the soles of his shoes. They're a special edition model. No way you can get those without a connection in the fashion world. He's waiting for an answer. So I drag my mind from the sludge of low-grade envy and look into his eyes. A dozen possibilities rush through my mind, only one of them good. Although good isn't exactly the right word, not in the moral sense. Are those still a thing, morals? I thought they were, but now I'm not so sure. Yes, I finally say, forcing the word out of my throat, like shoving a scared fat kid down a water slide. His smile gets a thousand lumens brighter before it suddenly vanishes. Letting my eyes relax as he pulls his feet off his desk and leans over. He peers over the marble-topped desk, his face reflected in its surface, smooth skin, plucked eyebrows, the perfect amount of facial hair. Thank you, he says. Seriously, this is important for all of us. By us, I know he means our team, which is made up of Robbie, me, two other guys, and one woman. Aside from Robbie, I'm the most senior. Now fuck off and get back to work, he says, leaning back again, with a smile back on his perfect and perfectly smashable face. The bastard, he has it all, and he's only two years older than me. As I leave his office, I tell myself that he was where I am now two years ago. If I play ball, do what I'm asked, and keep busting my ass, I'll be where he is in just two years. 730 days, 17,520 hours, 1,051,200 minutes. Of course, not all of that will be work time. I'll be sleeping for some of it. For all the other hours, I'll be commuting or social engineering or thinking about work. Working, sleeping, schmoozing, commuting. Just two more years of this shit before I can finally relax a little and enjoy myself. I'll be the goddamn boss. I'll walk around like I have brass balls and a credit card made of solid fucking gold. I nearly bump into Jaden, Robbie's assistant, when I'm heading out of the reception room. So sorry, Mr. Braxton, he says. Fucking watch it, I tell him. His face falls, and I almost tell him I'm kidding, but I resist the urge. It's good to keep the new guys on their toes. They have to pay their dues. We all do. I walk down the hall toward the elevators, passing half a dozen offices just like Robbie's, each with its own assistant. The place smells like unlit cigars, freshly polished leather, and baby powder. I'm only going down two floors, but I bypass the stairs and stop outside the bank of elevators. I like to look out the window at the city skyline stretching from horizon to horizon. I can see tiny cars bustling around in the bumper to bumper traffic below. I can see people moving along the sidewalks and crossing crosswalks. The view of the city suddenly brings a wave of melancholy down on me like a tsunami on a quaint fishing village. I lean against the window, my mouth suddenly full of hot saliva. What the hell did I just agree to? I feel ill. Two years, I tell myself, just two years. Hey, yo, Chucky, my man. The voice comes from behind me. I straighten at the window before turning around to face the man. Theodore Upton slaps me on the shoulder, a goofy grin on his face. What the hell are you doing on 67? He asks. I could ask you the same thing, I say. Shit, bitch, I'm moving up here soon, man, he says. One of the elevators dings. Theodore must have pressed the button. We step on, joining five other people. We're all going down, I guess. So it's official, I ask, reaching over to press 65. You got a raise? The door closes and the elevator moves. Well, no, not official official. You know how it is. Jerk offs gotta jerk you around first, right? Wait, what am I saying? Of course you know how it is. You're one of the guys who does the jerking, aren't you? Theodore laughs, laughs, turning to look over his shoulder to see if anyone else got the joke. Although it doesn't really make any sense. Theodore and I have almost the exact same job, just on different teams. I smile, 
clenching my teeth. Bile backs up into my throat and I cough once, choking on it before I swallow it back down. Whoa, you okay, man? Theodore asks. Relax, it's just a joke. The elevator opens on 65. Theodore and I step off and a couple of women step on. All right, asshole. Theodore says. See you later. Hey, Teddy. I say, stopping him before he heads to his shared office. Has Hank ever asked you to do something you weren't comfortable with? Are you fucking kidding me? Like every day. What's the problem, Chucky? Old Robbie asked you to burn some papers or something? He asked you to email some insider trading information to his latest fuck buddy? I don't answer. But Theodore doesn't wait long for me to say anything. Dude, the only guys who get in serious trouble are the ones who don't play ball. We protect our own. Stopping outside of Theodore's shared office, I look through the narrow window in the door. I can see down an aisle between the cubicles to an office with clear glass walls. There's a man sitting in the cramped office behind a desk. Theodore's boss, Hank Westgate. Hank has the same job title as my boss, Robbie, but he's stuck in an office down here on the 65th floor because my team always puts up better numbers. That's why Robbie gets the nice office upstairs, but Hank is jockeying for position, brown nosing with some of the higher ups. It's no secret he wants that office and Robbie knows it. Hank is looking down at his desk, but he seems to sense me. He brings his eyes up just as I step to my right. I don't think he saw me. Even if he did, it wouldn't matter anyway. I turn and head back the way I came, going to my shared office. Well, dear, you can come home and stay with us again if you need to, my mom says. I've read that a lot of people your age are doing that. Things are different nowadays. Not like when your father and I were your age. I roll my eyes, walking down the street toward the club. I don't really feel like partying tonight. My feet are killing me and I can barely keep my eyes open, but I don't have much of a choice. No, mom, I say. That's not at all what I'm asking. I don't need to come home. I don't want to come home. I mean, it would be nice to see you and dad for a change, but I can't make time for a vacation right now. We haven't seen you in so long. She says in her best guilt trip voice. I know, once I get this promotion. Anyway, what are your thoughts on what I asked? I'm coming up on a homeless shelter with a line spilling out along the sidewalk. I forgot they were building another shelter here. Seems like there's one on every block now. My tax dollars at work. Bunch of freeloaders. Making sure I don't get hit by a car, I cross the street to avoid the unwashed masses as my mom formulates an answer. It's hard to give you an answer without specifics, Charles, she says. But I guess my advice is just to do what you think is right. You have a good heart and a good head on your shoulders. If it feels like you're selling your soul, then it probably is. Yeah, but did you and dad ever have to do anything that you didn't want to do when you were coming up? Oh, sure, she says. Everyone has to do things they don't want to do. I'm afraid that's the way of the world. But you should never cross the line that... Okay, Mom, thanks. I gotta go. Love you. I hang up the phone just as I come up behind Theodore in the sidewalk talking to a couple of young ladies. This is exactly why I can't stay home at night. Because guys like Theodore are always out here, generating connections and building up their social credit. If I stay home, I fall behind. Well, hello there, ladies, I say, wrapping an arm around Theodore's neck. Are we ready to do some drinking? Chuck! Theodore says. I was just inviting these two lovely ladies into Mephisto's for a couple of stiff ones. He waggles his eyebrows as he says this. The two women, clearly not from our social strata, (laughs) giggle. I introduce myself as we cross the street, learning that their names are Alabaster and Juniper. I resist the urge to ask if those are their real names or if they're strippers. Mephisto's has two lines snaking down the block. The line on the left side of the door is populated by people like Alabaster and Juniper, hoping for a chance to get inside. Unfortunately for them, people that don't matter have to wait in line to get into the club. The other line, on the right side, is populated mostly by people dressed in rags. It could be a line from the homeless shelter I passed, as though there's been some sort of mistake. But there's no mistake. These people are trying to get into the club. 
just for very different reasons than the people on the left line. Theodore leads the way as we approach the pair of bouncers at the doorway. I see Theodore shake his head once, very discreetly, as we approach. The bouncers open the door and let Theodore and me inside, but they stop the ladies. We both turn around and look at them. Their faces are petrified, but there's still some hope in them. They think we'll be able to talk to the bouncers to let them in. They think they'll be the envy of the entire line of people trying to look like they don't care whether they get in, but they're wrong. Oh, sorry ladies, Theodore says. I forgot, this place has standards. The embarrassment on their faces is priceless. We laugh as the door shuts and we head up the stairs. Oh man, that never gets old, I say, ignoring a sudden bout of nausea. Must have been something I ate. Mephisto's has nine levels of dance floors, bars, lounge areas, and private rooms. The bouncers at the door occasionally let people in to purchase overpriced drinks on the first floor. But it's not where anyone wants to be. It's kind of like a waiting area where the desperate wait and hope to be brought upstairs. Each floor has its own set of bouncers, controlling who can go up to the next level. The highest floor Theodore and I can get to is the fifth. We've heard wild stories about what goes on at the levels above, but we'll have to wait to find out for ourselves whether they're true. Our bosses, Robbie and Hank, do their partying on the sixth floor for the most part, but they sometimes come down to rub elbows with their lessers, which is what we do as we make our way through the club. On the second level, we move through the thrumming dance floor and toward a bar at the edge of the room. Lights flash in time with the bumping music while people dance and chat and laugh. We pass a line of booths on our left. The homeless people who've made it inside stick out like sore thumbs. Of course, that's kind of the idea. The founders of Mephisto's had a genius idea to use homeless people as personal waiters for anyone who requests one. They work only for tips and the club doesn't have to worry about pesky things like paying them an hourly wage or giving them tax documents or anything. Apparently, the owners of Mephisto's found some kind of legal loophole in the city's laws that allows them to don charity status. The homeless people volunteer and take what they can get as far as tips. Of course, things are a little different on the other, higher floors. Given what goes on up there, there's a general consensus that the homeless who work those floors will walk away with a decent chunk of change. Theodore and I grab a drink and see who's around. We stay on the second level just long enough to feel like we've been seen before heading up to the third. We don't spend too much time here because there's no one important around. On the fourth level, we pass homeless people who volunteered to work here. They act as human footrests or seats for patrons. Many of them are dressed in their underwear. Some dance in front of tables while the patrons laugh and throw dollar bills at them. It really is brilliant, a win-win for everyone. The bar saves money, which it then passes on to the consumers who then pass it on in the form of tips to the homeless people. Trickle down economics at work. Gotta love capitalism. After stopping briefly on the fourth floor, we head up to the fifth, where the real action is at. We find a private room with some of our coworkers inside, stepping into a wave of shouted greetings. The room features screens on all the walls showing camera feeds from the dance floor and bar outside, so we can see who's here. It also has two large booths facing each other, on the wall under one of the screens and between the two booths is a homeless man with a bushy gray beard. His arms and legs are fastened to the wall with restraints. He's dressed only in a ratty pair of underwear. I can see a bunch of fresh scars on his skin. He must be a regular. Well, who do we have today? Theodore says, stepping up to the man. I don't recognize this one. What's your name, man? The guy lifts his hanging head, shame seeming to spill out of his eyes with his tears. Travis, he says. Oh, Travis, Theodore says loudly, <laughs> looking around and getting laughs from some of the people in the room. Nice to meet you. Theodore turns away, but then spins around and spits in Travis's face. You're the biggest piece of shit I've ever met, Theodore says. You're worthless, and I would like to gut you with a knife right here and now. Nothing would make me happier. The room goes suddenly quiet at this outburst. We all look at each other before bursting into laughter. The party continues while Theodore pulls out a hundred dollar bill and shoves it into the waistband of Travis's underwear. Just wait until you get to the eighth floor, Teddy! Someone shouts. 
I hear you can do that up there. Laughter ensues. I know this is just the beginning for Travis. As the night goes on and people get more wasted, he'll take much more abuse, both physical and mental, but he'll walk away with a decent chunk of cash. Not enough to afford an apartment in this city, but still better than nothing. At least he's working for a living and not just living off of handouts. My nausea intensifies and I look down at my drink. I don't know if it's something I ate or if there's something in this damn drink that doesn't agree with me. Either way, I set it down and head out toward the bathroom. As I'm making my way toward the restrooms, I see Hank coming down the stairs from the sixth floor. Moving swiftly to my left, I duck behind a pillar so he doesn't see me. He must be calling it an early night because he heads down toward the fourth level. I follow at a safe distance, trailing behind him as he goes all the way down to the first level, where he stops and talks to a tall brunette woman in a sparkly dress. She throws her head back in laughter at something he says. She's really laying it on thick. I watch from the other side of the dance floor as they chat for a minute. The woman points up the stairs and pouts. She seems to want to go up there and she thinks Hank will take her. She must know the rules. After a little more back and forth, they head toward the exit. I wait a few beats before following, stepping outside and looking to see which way they went. I spot them to the right, crossing the street to the next block. That sick feeling in my stomach intensifies as I walk down the sidewalk, eyes fixed on Hank and the woman. They walk arm in arm. Every so often, the woman laughs loudly at something Hank says. If it's genuine laughter, then I'm Elon Musk. Still, Hank doesn't seem to mind. All he cares about is that she's humoring him all the way to bed. Putting a hand in my pocket, I feel the small knife I always carry. You never know when you'll need to defend yourself on these grimy streets. Ahead of me, Hank and the woman turn down a small side street. They must be going to her apartment because Hank certainly wouldn't live in this part of town. Fingering the knife, I turn the corner after them. I'm closing the distance. Every time the woman laughs her awful, fake laugh, I rush ahead, using the sound to cover my footsteps. So far, they haven't looked back. They're oblivious. I'm about 10 yards away now, walking on my toes so as not to make much noise. We're alone on the street, and there's an alleyway coming up on the right. They're going to pass right by it. Glancing behind me to make sure we're alone, I think I see movement, like a person ducking into a doorway to hide. Is someone following me? I shake it off. Now's my chance. They're approaching the alley. Pulling the knife out of my pocket, I flip the blade open and hide it behind my right thigh as I rush forward. Hank! I call. Hank and the woman turn around. They're right next to the alley. Hank looks at me with disgust. What the fuck do you want, Braxton? He says. He has no idea what's coming. I step up close, a pleasant smile on my face. I try to ignore the sick feeling in my stomach, even though I feel like I might vomit at any moment. You dropped something, I say, taking the knife from behind my leg and jamming it into his chest. Leaving the knife sticking out of him, I shift and punch the woman in the face. She totters backward and collapses into the alley, unconscious. Turning my attention back to Hank, I'm pleased to see that he's still staring down at the knife, dumbfounded. I grab the weapon with one hand and shove him into the alley with the other. He trips over the woman and falls onto his back. I jump on him, stabbing him in a frenzy just to get it over with. After plunging the blade into him a good 15 times, I lurch up and vomit against the alley wall. Oh, you asshole. A familiar voice says from behind me. I turn, vomit still dripping from my nose and mouth. Theodore stands there, looking down at his boss like he's a plate of spilled food. You fucking asshole. As I look around wildly, a thousand thoughts rush through my mind. Do I kill him now too? How can I not? I'll go to jail if I let him live. Leading with the knife, I stagger toward him. He looks up at me. You don't waste any time, do you? He says. This stops me in my tracks. I stare at him in confusion. Dude, he says. How did you think I was going to move up to 67? Hank told me to kill Robbie. That's what I was doing up there today. I was casing the place seeing where I could hide. I know Robbie works late, so I figured that would be my chance. Of course, the bastard left early today, but damn, man, I guess you're taking Hank's spot now. Good on you. I spit bile and shake my head. What? What the hell are you talking about? Theodore's eyes narrow as he looks at me. 
Wait, you're not really broken up about this, are you? He laughs. Holy shit, man. You'll never get ahead like that. Are you serious right now? Dumbfounded, I look down at Hank's corpse. That sick feeling comes back, and I gag. Theodore steps toward me. I raise the knife, and he stops. Whoa, whoa, man, he says. It's okay, dude. I'm not going to hurt you or rat you out or anything. Just don't stab me, okay? I lower the knife, but keep it in my hand, as Theodore puts his arm around me. I don't get you, he says. I mean, what about the homeless woman we killed last week? You fucking cooked and ate a chunk of her ass. I've seen you kill dozens of people. What's wrong with you? I shake my head. Yeah, but all those people were poor or middle class. They don't count. They don't matter. Hank, though, he's one of us, man. He's one of us. It just doesn't seem right. <laughs> Theodore giggles. You still holding on to notions of right and wrong? How naive can you get? Oh, but I forgot you come from humble upper middle class beginnings. You're a fucking unicorn, man. I always forget. He sighs. Just take my word for it, man. This is how things are done sometimes. Really, it's all in the game. I don't answer. I just stare down at the body. Remember what I told you today? Theodore asks. I said that the guys who play ball get taken care of, remember? And you're playing ball. It'll be fine. The guys at the top really love a cutthroat mindset. Literally. He laughs, <laughs> reminding me of the woman I knocked out. I look over to where she lies nearby, still unconscious. Theodore follows my gaze. You thinking what I'm thinking? He says, turning to look at me. I smile and nod. There's the asshole I know and love, he says. I'll help you hide this prick's body, and then we'll take the girl and have some fun. How about that? I nod. Yeah, okay, I say. It'll make me feel better. Nothing like killing some poor dumb idiot to take your mind off work, Theodore says, bending down to grab Hank's feet. He's right. As I step over to grab Hank at the armpits, I glance at the woman. She's starting to stir. Thoughts of the fun we'll have with her make that sick feeling in my stomach go away. And I think about moving up to the 67th floor. I think about going up to the sixth level at Mephisto's, and then the seventh and the eighth and ninth. I'll get there eventually. You just gotta keep at it, I tell myself, hefting Hank's body. Keep playing the game. Your hard work will pay off. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy these stories, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and check out some more of my episodes here.